Okay, so Ross, um, you have many years of experience working in media entrepreneurship and in the media landscape in general. Right. Can you tell me, you know, uh, how, what are the biggest changes we've seen in the last three to five years in the media That's landscape? Three to five years. Okay. You, you know, in Asia, in the US, comparatively or overall? Mm, okay, so the biggest changes two big changes from my perspective. Mm -hmm. One is the way content is distributed. So five years ago, you would design a website, you would search engine optimize it, and then you would have Google or Baidu or one of the search engines would send you traffic. Mm -hmm. But you would capture the story and you would capture the audience on a site that you had branded. Mm -hmm. And now the what seems to be a very big trend that actually started here in Asia, which is with, with WeChat, mm -hmm. is that people are now building content brands that are distributed. So you would read the story on Facebook, you'll read the story on WeChat, you'll see the video on Snapchat, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very big change. Um, and then along with that change has been a big change in the way the advertising industry works. So the mm -hmm. ad industry has kind of two functions, one to drive sales. So it's kind of a very direct, you know, you click on the ad, the ad takes you to the buy button, the buy button, you buy the item and everybody's happy. Mm -hmm. And that business has become almost like an auto automated stock exchange, right? Programmatic buying has made those businesses very efficient, but that doesn't always benefit a brand that has very high respect, but very few pages, mm -hmm. right? Then the other thing that's happening, the other piece of advertising is brand advertising. The advertising that makes you feel good about going to Starbucks, that makes you feel good about spending more money on a Gucci bag than a bag you might buy at H&M. Uh -huh. And that advertising has become much more, is increasingly internalized, right? It's being, become part of the brand itself. So Gucci mm -hmm. is as likely to write a story about Gucci as the New York Times or the mm -hmm. South China Morning Post is. Uh, and that's a big change because the cost of them doing their own advertising is actually lower than for them to do it with a media company. So that changes the dynamics of mm -hmm. how content's distributed and how you pay for the content. So in that sense, does it mean that we're seeing sort of a breakdown of online media? Because if Gucci gets to write about Gucci, mm -hmm. and if you, if, you think, if you think of it more in terms of, from say, a news perspective, mm -hmm. as a watchdog media perspective, you know, how, how a traditional, for example, news media supposed to survive in this, in this environment? And if they are, what are they doing? What innovative strategies are they using to stay afloat? You know, I don't, you don't see a lot of it. Mm -hmm. and I w and, but I, ha I have to believe that you will. And that is you're going to see media increasingly defined less as an institution than as almost a, this sounds, almost almost a club, almost a membership club. So people that are committed to things like watchdog media or investigative journalism mm -hmm. will become much more of an association. Mm -hmm. And they'll share resources, they may develop products together that they share across the platform. You see that happening a lot in places like Taiwan, you see it happening mm -hmm. a lot like in places like the US. Um, what it means for the institution of media, the Comcasts, the TVBs, yeah. the Straits Times Publishing, I think that's a big. I think that's a big question. They're either not big enough, so they're mm -hmm. not as big as QQ. They're not as or Tencent. They're not as big as Google, and yet they're not small enough to be nimble. Um, so uh, there is a question about where they fit mm -hmm. and which direction they move. Um, but that question has been around since the internet started in the '90s. So mm -hmm. it's. But I think it is going to become more acute for companies like the New York Times and Pearson and the Financial Times. I, I think see. it'll become more acute. So are you saying that it's easier to survive in today's landscape if you're smaller, do you think, as a media Depends company? on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Depends on what you're doing. If your focus is on creating content, in some cases it may be easier for you to put together a small team, mm -hmm. somebody that is the videographer, somebody that is the sound person, somebody that will help you with the story put together a small team and then then distribute it yourself. Mm -hmm. And you do see people doing that. Uh, you're nimbler, you have less control over the con on over the the subject matter. Mm -hmm. uh, and I actually think you see more creativity there. Um, but at the same time, 
you know, if you're, what you're doing requires a lot of technology, then you begin to create an institution, right? Mm -hmm. I see. And so, um, my final question to mm -hmm. you is, what do you look for in uh, a pitch? You know, if you, if, if you have uh, an investment fund, mm -hmm. um, which concentrates on media-related projects. Right. So what do you look for in a pitch or in, in a new idea that, that's put forward to you that, you that would make you say, yes, this, this has it's potential? It's a good question. It's a good question. So, you know, pitches come in different sizes. So they're mm -hmm. never before seen the light of day. I thought of it this morning when I got up to, I've been operating for five years and I need $15 million. Mm -hmm. But at every stage, there are a couple of things that are common. The person that is pitching, right? Uh, we often look at the individual and their team very closely. Uh -huh. Because in the end, uh, and we didn't tend not to invest in brand new startups, things that have never been built before. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not really an angel. We really sit in that first stage, first investment. Mm -hmm. And in that period, you're looking, because what you think you're doing in that period often changes. 24 months later, mm -hmm. your market idea, your audience definition may have all pivoted, as they say. Um, but in each case, you're looking at a person. You're looking at a collection of people, the teamwork, the camaraderie, mm -hmm. a little bit the understanding of the market. Mm -hmm. Do you have some unique interpretation or understanding of the market that you that is different from other people? And then finally, the market itself, right? Are you working in a market that is, you know, the internet's really a bit about scale, it has traditionally been about scale, building big things, right? Yeah. And if you're in a market, if you define a market that is actually quite small, then you need to show, you need to t uh, make me understand why that small is going to be valuable to me as an investor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And I'm sorry, just, I now thought Last of another question. question. Um, in terms of what you're seeing on, in the media landscape today, mm -hmm. what is what are what is one or some of the companies that you think really are going to change things, or people have to keep an eye on because they might further mm -hmm. change the the media landscape as online media landscape as we see it. So I think you should always be paying attention to the five or ten big. You'll hear them called in Silicon Valley the blue chips of the internet. So uh -huh. they're the Facebook, Google, Tencent, Alibaba, Amazon. Mm -hmm. You can make a list. You should pay attention to them because they all know that they can't rest. So they're all continually looking at innovating. Mm -hmm. Anybody in the mobile, social, video space should be paying attention. Mm -hmm. What do we see in terms of content startups? There's some very interesting things happening around video in various sizes, shapes, mm -hmm. formats, lengths. Um, you are beginning to see, I think for the first time, very unique content plays. There either be one or two people working. Um, in some cases, they're almost like studios, right? Mm -hmm. There's one uh, in the US, we had a, the podcasting in the last two years has become very, very, not so much popular, it's gotten a lot of attention because two or three major podcasts have kind mm -hmm. of taken off. Mm -hmm. And so what you're seeing though is people that are podcast, almost like movie studios for podcasting. Wow. Uh, and those are interesting, you know, will they have enough scale, can they produce enough podcasts that out of maybe five podcasts that they create, five mm -hmm. series they create, maybe one or two kind of get lift off, they get trajectory, mm -hmm. then the cost of the other three you can kind of absorb. Mm -hmm. But to see that kind of studio economics come forward, we haven't seen it yet, mm -hmm. but there are definitely people that are working on that idea, of kind of creating factories for content. Mm -hmm. Studio, I like the word studio better than factory, but you know. <laughs> okay. uh, but that we see, you're seeing a lot of, and it's both here in Asia as well as in North America, even in other parts of South, of Asia than East Asia and Southeast Asia, you're beginning to see some really interesting studio-like concepts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much for your perspective, no problem. Ross. It was wonderful speaking Good with you. Good to see you. Thank you.